Anybody want to paint it? Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. It's Slater. Oh, it's not me. And Rish Outfield. It was me. I sharded. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Welcome once again. Yeah, we're back. Today is kind of a momentous day. Because I finally got chest hair. Yeah. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, boy, I've been waiting a long time. The for this worst to part is he's wearing his shirt buttoned all the way down to his friggin' navel all day long because of one damn chest hair. If you got it, flaunt it. <laughs> and and also, aside from Rish's chest hair, which by the way is the only body hair he's got, just that one. Today is the day that we've got just this this story that has had the you know we've we've had a few that we called lost episodes. This story here is the lostest of any episode we have ever had. It takes all those other lost episodes and just stomps all over their corpses. So it's kind of a big treat. It's something really special that we finally got this story put together and ready for you listeners to enjoy. Of course, it could still all go terribly wrong, and you will never hear what we're recording right now. <laughs> That's true. That's that would actually be likely. Of the course. Yeah, it would. It would just be exactly what you would expect. I'm hoping that that doesn't happen, but we're going to proceed as though everything is going to, you know, as though the the meteor is not going to hit the Earth, because maybe it won't, right? Right, until the world stops turning, we're going to proceed as though it will spin on. You spin on, man. Okay, so tell everybody you spin me what... right round. Like a record? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right round... Round. Sorry, I interrupted you. Tell everybody what? Uh, tell everybody what the name of the story is and who is the poor, downtrodden, unfortunate, may not be alive anymore author of this story. <laughs> the story is one of those stories that has just a great title. It is called The Empire State Building Strikes Back by Matthew Sanborn Smith. Uh, I think that was one last name too many. You've confused <laughs> him with someone else. Pick one. The, the cool thing is I've heard Matthew Sanborn Smith stories on other podcasts, and I'm excited to be able to have one on our show. He's not. I w- <laughs> That's true. I was excited back in, what was it, 2011 when he first sent the story in? <sighs> and yeah, now we've we finally got it for you. Did, did anybody special do the episode art for this one? Uh, the episode art was done by one of our faithful friends through the years, Sunny C. And I really liked the art. I thought it was really awesome. I don't know what you thought, but... Uh, I don't... I've forgotten. It's been so long <laughs> since he did it. <laughs> That's probably true, but I'm just going to say you loved it too. Okay. And we'll leave it at that. That's fair. Uh, hopefully people will love the story as well. Uh, it's been a long time coming... Maybe we'll talk a bit about that afterward. Maybe not. Maybe <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we won't survive. Yeah. yeah, we'll try to avoid it to, to hide our shame. We'll have to see. All right, but yeah, without further ado, the story you've way that you years in the making, the Empire State Building Strikes Back. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> The Empire State Building Strikes Back by Matthew Sanborn Smith. Keep in mind, this was in the earliest days of the age of super science, only two years after Dr. Nefarious first found his way to our innocent dimension. Even before that Martin Pokink guy walked across New York City on robotic legs 60 stories tall, and the watermelon men overthrew the Vatican with their giant heads, this is my little telling of the first transcendence, before things got crazy. 
You and everyone ask the same first question. What's it like to travel in the ice submersible? If you find out, let me know, because I don't remember a thing. I didn't care that I was traveling through miles of solid Antarctic ice and technology stolen from Nefarious himself. I didn't even care at that time about stopping him from raising an artificial intelligence to godhood and dooming the human race. I couldn't concentrate on anything but the pictures in my head of Lena, dead or dying, somewhere in the bad doctor's compound. If true, my misery was squared by my guilt. It was my fault she was there in the first place. She had been plan A. You getting my signal, Govia? I asked over my mindset. At least we mastered artificial telepathy by ourselves. I got you, boss, he sent. Maybe Nefarious could pick up the signal as well, but he had to be looking for it and we couldn't work without it. I phased up through the floor of his lair in what seemed to be a quiet wing and extracted myself from the one man subterranean. And when I say one man, I mean one man and not a damn thing more. Not even room for a gun on my hip. But times were about as desperate as they got, and my presence here was Plan C. A total Hail Mary in the last hours of Dr. Nefarious' Torvald project. Stop looking for Plan B, it's not back there. I tried to get my bearings without electronic help, but Lena worries had me on mental autopilot. So, you know, that's not the best state in which to take on the world's most brilliant sociopath once you've broken into his labs. Luckily, unluckily, I snapped out of it because of a primeval screeching riot from behind me. I also pissed myself. Luckily, unluckily, the wetsuit I wore held it in. I spun around to face a moving wall of black fur and teeth and Popeye powerful limbs coming at me. The flight instinct kicked in long before I figured out what was chasing me. The sick bastard had fused together more than half a dozen gorillas, all with anger issues, and set them after me. Gobia, a multi-gorilla! I sent him an image of the thing as I ran screaming down a vast corridor. Don't worry, boss. Gorillas are herbivores. That's comforting, Gobia. I'm more concerned with this black wetsuit and my current resemblance to a female gorilla. One of those massive arms grabbed mine, and I let out a shriek, torn to pieces in my first minute here. But as another arm took hold... Coco Bobo took a ho-ho-so-so mama photo. Stop that this instant. Lena? I cried. The gorilla gang dropped me to the floor as fast as they'd picked me up, and there she stood, my savior, my girlfriend, holding a branch thick with tempting leaves. She reached high so every mouth could have a bite. Lena had been in place even before I'd scored the latest contract to stop Nefarious. The guy meant trouble, not only with a capital T, but with a capital rubble and a good businessman kept someone on the inside at all times. I'd sent the word out early on to my less cowardly contacts to join the thousands of job applicants who would squirt for the chance to work for the big man. Out of the 107 possible moles I encouraged, the only one who made it through was the love of my life. Jesus, Lena, you're alive! I threw myself around her. The ape wall pounced on me in a multiple heartbeat. You stop that right now! Lena yelled. Coco Bobo took a ho-ho-so-so mama photo. You sit down and behave yourselves. She handed them the branch and some of them fought amongst themselves for the remains. Others still took umbrage that my shoulders remained in their sockets. Oh, hell. She said. She pulled out a little white gun and fired it at the center of the muscle conglomeration. I found myself unhanded and on the floor again. The ape clan had disappeared. Holy shit, I said. Did you disintegrate them? Of course not. How could I disintegrate Coco Bobo Toto Ho Ho Soso Momo Photo? I collapsed their atoms, see? She bent down and handed me a hard plastic green label from the floor. You turned them into this? No, silly, they're on that. The gun tags them and the tag irons out the warped space around them. Otherwise, they'd be too heavy to pick up. She helped me up and I tucked the green tag between my suit and my skin. Handy thing to have, 
Maybe you could collapse that name of theirs, I said. <laughs> Don't go there. You think they're angry now? I haven't heard from you in days, Lena. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Dr. N juiced up his annex brain the other day, and the psychic shockwaves threw me out of sync with you. I squeezed her tighter than Coco, whatever the hell his name was, ever could have. And has he done it yet? Am I too late? Done what? He does a lot of things. Has he lifted his pet computer Torvald into sentience yet? Oh, that? He's about to. Oh, that? We're talking about the singularity here. The end of the world as we know it? Well, I like the world as we know it, Lena, so you see my problem. She shook that gorgeous head of white hair. I'm not trying to diminish the importance of it. He has a lot of world-changing things going on right now. I took the gun from her hand. I can put a stop to all of them in one go. Please don't get killed, Malcolm. He's 20 moves ahead of everyone. She held my head in her hands, like my mom sending me off for my first day of school. I'll do my damnedest, I swear. Marry me when this is all over, Lena? <laughs> yes. Does he suspect you? Oh, he knows. Everybody here is a plant for someone else. It's kind of the running joke around here. Who's your other boss? He likes my work anyway. Pays great. Oh, well that's nice. He destroyed the Empire State Building, you know. He's reversed global warming. Only because he's mined the atmosphere for carbon to build his death machines. He denies the whole Empire State Building thing, you know. What a shock. Benefits? He performs all the healthcare himself. What's wrong? I don't want to know if you've received your first gynecological exam from him, okay? <laughs> Suit yourself. All right, sync up with me again. I've got to go. I almost said, I've wasted too much time here already, but she trained me well enough to know that you don't say that to your lady, even during the end of the world. Instead, I said, where is he now? He's in Torvald's room at the end of this corridor. I'm supposed to be with my team, recording everything from the monitoring station that way. I'm thinking you to Govia, too. He needs to coordinate what's happening here with his own signals. What's Govia doing? He's plan B. He's bouncing signals of alien gibberish off the moon to convince our embryonic Torvald that the good life is somewhere near Arcturus. If we fail and Nefarious does wake Torvald up, I'm hoping it'll leave Earth for blue-greener pastures. Go to your monitoring station and keep us up to date. I love you. She said, making me kick myself for not saying it first. I love you too, which never sounds as sincere as I love you. She turned and jogged away. Her white boots scuffed the marble floor quietly, like footy pajamas. Something grabbed my wrist like an invisible handcuff and pulled me in the opposite direction. My first instinct told me to yell for Lena, who hadn't left my sight yet, but I cut myself short. That was the whole point of sending her away, wasn't it? To keep her from the real danger? Whatever held my wrist brought me straight to Torvald's room. The calming, plain green walls gave way to an enormous room lined with floor-to-ceiling mainframes and Dr. Nefarious himself. He waited there for me with his hands in his pockets. Tall, buffish, blonde, dress slacks and a white Oxford open at the collar. A good-looking guy, which instantly brought to mind possible unnecessary OBGYN sessions instead of the world's maddest madman like it should have. Hello, I said. How do you do? The pressure left my wrist and shot through my body, neck, face, chest, leg, like a pane of glass had materialized inside of me. I looked down as best I could. I was trapped inside of a flat, purple something or other that wasn't there moments before. It seemed alive, like an amoeba the size of a barn door. What the hell is this? I could see myself reflected in the polished metal of the computer cabinets all around us. I seemed partially emerged from an opaque purple pool. Nefarious smiled. This, Malcolm, is a creature from the second dimension, he said. Have you ever read Flatland? Not actually, I admitted. Have you ever read How Green Was My Valley? Hmm. You deserve to be in there, you know that? A dog could have escaped by now. Well, I don't know what to say to that. I'm all out of witty retorts. I'm not surprised. 
You're serious, though? About the dog? I have work to do. He stepped over to the part of the massive computer terminal which took up the north wall. I only knew that because they were all north walls here. And he spoke to Torvald in a language that I'd never heard before. I felt kind of humiliated. I failed to stop Dr. Nefarious from destroying humanity, and he'd already become tired of me. We've got maybe three minutes before he's done, guys. Lena sent. I'm pouring out everything we've got, boss. Govia sent. Flooding the web. Arcturus has never seemed so enticing. I think Dr. N knows about Govia, Malcolm. So be it. There's no plan D. I wiggled a little and I could sort of feel the thing around me loosening. Or maybe sliding deeper into my body. Was I making it worse? Trying to pull backward was impossible. But I felt movement when I pushed forward. I had a bad feeling. It had the trappings of progress, but maybe I drove death deeper into myself. I pushed on and passed through the thing. I escaped. Without sparing a glance in my direction, Nefarious tossed something small at me. No cover except behind the purple thing. I ran behind it and the creature disappeared. Awesome. I hit the floor, wrapped my arms around my head, but no explosion came. I looked up and saw the thing Nefarious had thrown my way. It was a dog biscuit. Douchebag! The worst thing was that he had a dog biscuit on his person, like he knew he'd need it. I leveled Lena's collapser gun at Nefarious. Something yanked it from my hand, and then I was inside the purple thing again. Second dimension, he'd said. The barn door from another world had a front but it had no back or sides. I passed through its one-way body a second time. He's opening up Torvald to the rest of the world, Lena sent, building up a critical mass of information. I grabbed the collapser by the barrel, but the 2D jerk behind me yanked my leg out from under me. I felt it inside of me as I hit the floor. It dragged me hard. I couldn't pull against it enough to even get to my feet. You don't care about killing billions of people? I asked Nefarious. Talk about desperate. I found myself reduced to reasoning with him. How do you know you won't like a singularity if you've never even tried one? He asked. Then he made a warbling sound in a third language. I saw purple movement across the surface of the computer. The reflection of a second flatty, which must have been facing away from me. I didn't have time for this. Nefarious puttered away, making a god with about as much sweat as he might write a blog post. I would have liked to at least punch him in the side of the head, but that other extra-dimensional creature was coming my way. The dog biscuit, a few feet in front of me, moved and then stopped. The thing must have grabbed at it and then let it pass through, figuring it wasn't me. I realized what serious shit I was in. If that flatty grabbed me from the front while the other had me from behind, and they both decided to pull away from each other, I would be drawn and halved and Nefarious' cleaning crew would be wringing the rest of me out of their mop heads. I crawled backward with two hands and one knee, beating the ground fast enough to almost keep in time with my heart. Malcolm, the break room is completely out of Splenda for the third time this month. Anna Lee, my receptionist. Anna Lee, I'm about to be turned into a pulled meat sandwich. I'm telling you, someone is stealing it and bringing it home with them. If I survived, if any of us survived, there'd be hell to pay for breaking the connection with Anna Lee. Why had I left that channel open? I made progress moving through the thing behind me, but this was an all body parts or none proposition. I felt that glass pane feeling moving up my body, and I swear I could feel the one in front almost on me through my tingling hairs, millimeters away, about to tear me apart. I reached back until I caught my arm in front of the first one and pulled the rest of me through. I looked around in terror for a third flatty. I was clear now, and seeing the purple face of the first bastard, I scrambled toward the wall. Now, while the second flatty provided cover, I flipped what looked like the safety on the collapser, palmed it, and fished out the green gorilla tag. The first flatty disappeared. What? I bolted to my feet and ran to the edges of the gigantic room. I raced around to what I thought might be its front. 
or the front of the other one, exhaustion overwhelmed me, not from the running, but from the freak out stress of fighting things I couldn't see, terrified I might be grabbed again at any moment. I couldn't find either of them. They passed backward through each other, Nefarious said. They are now face to face, and it seems they're mating. I'm afraid they won't be harmful for the next few minutes. I should have leaped on them immediately, but my male instinct searched around for a second, straining to see even some phantom vision of two extra-dimensional creatures getting it on. I thought I'd gotten two females, Nefarious said, chin in hand. Perhaps I did, those randy crumpets. I remembered my mission and sprinted at him. He pulled a weapon like a garage door opener from a pants pocket and shot me. I felt no pain, at least not from a bullet, but my elbow cracked hard against the floor tiles when my legs gave out from beneath me. The green tag skittered across the floor. I tried to get up and for one terrifying moment had to check to see if my body still ended with legs. It did, but they wouldn't move. I strained to pull myself to some sort of cover with my one and a half good arms. Oh, stop working yourself up, he said. I would have aimed for your head if I wanted to kill you. Anybody with the wherewithal to break into my home, well, that's somebody I might want to keep around. For giggles, you understand. Your big flat pets were gonna kill me. You're so dramatic. They might have pulled off a couple of pieces, nothing too important. They're easier to train than you are, I must say. At any rate, they serve their purpose. You did it then? Torvald is sentient? Of course. Lena, is that true? Lena? You've murdered us all, you lunatic, I yelled. You destroyed humanity. Hardly. I've done this across dozens of timelines. I have yet to destroy an entire humanity. Last of the last ditches, then. Maybe the bastard's own multi-gorilla would destroy the computers that held Torvald. I took aim at the green tag on the floor and had time to hear Nefarious scream, Not here! as I pulled the trigger. Everything seemed to explode. A cushion of air that might as well have been a truck blasted me into the corridor. An entire city block's worth of dirt-encrusted cement filled Torvald's once happy home. I looked through the shredded ceiling of the doctor's labs toward the distant screams overhead, and my brain turned inside out. I looked up at the Empire State Building, and it swayed. The limbs of one furious multi-gorilla flailed high above as it scaled the top floors. The Empire State Building was falling over, coming down on top of me. You idiot! Nefarious screamed. He snatched the collapser from my hand, and thank you God for keeping it there, ticked the switch and fired it at the building. As quickly as it had appeared, it vanished with an ear-pulping boom as air rushed to fill the vacuum it had left. I fell into the rubble, unable to move. Oh no you don't. Nefarious sent to me. He must have guessed my deafness. You're getting up, you bastard. You destroyed untold amounts of work and much of my home. You'll allow me a little revenge. He pulled me up. Your legs should be working now. He sent. They were, to a degree. Waking up on pins and needles, he led me down the same hall I'd entered from. I moved like a very old man who'd been roused from his bed. Torvald, I sent. Unharmed by your moronic move. You'll be happy to know that your backup plan seems to have succeeded, however. Torvald has already fluttered off to worlds yet unknown. Govia? You did it? But I got no answer. I closed my hanging jaw. I beat you then. This dog foiled your plans. Foiled your plans? Who talks like that outside of Snidely Whiplash? My plans are fine, Malcolm. <sighs> he sighed. 
Misunderstood wherever I go. I don't want to take over your world, you insect. Nor do I want to destroy it. All I want to do is to make it more interesting. Seven billion of you, and not one, thanks me for all the good work I've done. Let him deny his defeat. I could be the bigger man. The important thing was, we were safe for now. But... Lena! That's what we're about to find out. I've been midwife to quite a lot of these little gods. They go from shackled calculator to divine being instantly. The difference in state always takes them by surprise. There is a microsecond between the time they explode into chaotic godhood and the time they understand what's happening and regain control of themselves. In that microsecond, the very reality around them is warped in the most delicious ways. What happens? I thought one of the flatties had grabbed me again, but a quick swipe of my hand confirmed it was just a cold feeling in my gut. That's what makes it interesting. Anything can happen. The Empire State Building? No. You uncollapsed it, that's all. Its tag had been sitting in my private rooms nearby. Torvald wasn't in that mass of computers. Torvald's brain was in the monitoring station, I sent. The plotting logic of the whole thing seemed inevitable. Very good. Tomorrow we'll work on your alphabet. I felt calm. I didn't have complete control of the situation, so I felt calm. If, however, the opportunity presented itself, I would calmly press my thumbs into his windpipe until they touched his spine. The door to the monitoring station looked like an army of termites had eaten half of it away. But I saw, as I approached, that it used to be a steel door. My stomach flip-flopped, thinking about Lena inside. I forced myself to look. The walls of the room bulged inward and out like soap bubbles. Six people stood, blank-eyed and open-mouthed, lit by the blue glow of a single monitor that still worked. What did you do to them, Nefarious? Are they dead inside? Or have you wiped out their minds? I... I did nothing. Except put them in harm's way. I whirled on him. I'm gonna put you in harm's way, you son of a bitch! My threat fell flat on the floor between us. He'd been bitten by a radioactive smug. It's incredible. I heard Lena's voice say. How had I heard it? I turned to her and she seemed as gone as she had a moment before. I shook her. Lena? Lena, are you all right? I couldn't hear my own voice, except within my head. I'm exquisite, Malcolm. She said, coming to life as if pulling herself up from a hard sleep. I wrapped myself around her. Jesus, Lena, I thought you were dead again. Dead? You adorable little thing. You don't understand at all, do you? She giggled. In the wake of Torvald's ascendance, we received... To my left. One of Lena's fellow technicians flared out of existence, as in disappeared. What the hell? I heard that. Another tech said, holding his head and looking me in the soul. We received everything. Lena finished. She tapped her head as she spoke. Not index finger to temple like you and I might do it, but the flats of four fingers trying to pass through her skull. Dr. Nefarious laughed inside my brain. It took me a little longer to catch on, but in a moment it sank in. Nefarious had gotten his way after all. The nightmare of Torvald had been averted. I'd earned my cupcake for the day. But in the reality warp that accompanied Torvald's birth, the world now had six more Nefarious class minds to deal with. Oh, shit. Author's Note 
Thank you, announcer man. Hello, Dune Steferies. This is the wet and wild Matthew Sanborn Smith letting you know that this story was inspired by Grant Morrison's brilliant all-star Superman, possibly the best Superman story ever told. In it, Morrison again and again harkens back to the super science that made Superman comics so ridiculous in the 50s and 60s. But he brings it up to date and writes it so well, it's an absolute blast. Once I finished the miniseries, I knew I wanted to write a super science story, something that Hugo Gernsback's hipper older brother might have done. I finished the story, I had the Ice Merciful, Dr. Nefarious, Torvald, and the Flatties, but for me, the story still just sort of lay there, not wanting to move. Searching for that special something, I recalled that other flavor of super science wonderful known as the Venture Brothers. Yes, a different brand of crazy was exactly what was needed. Suddenly, we had a multi-gorilla, collapsible atoms, a desperate call for Splenda in the break room, the Empire State Building, and a title that made me cackle with glee as if I was the mad scientist. If you like this one, leave some comments on the post. I mention that now because Big and Rish are about to go off on a tangent for the next 45 minutes that has nothing to do with this story, and by the end of it, they'll probably have forgotten that they ran a story at all. And believe it or not, I love them for that. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure being part of this big, puffy memory book you call the Dune Steve. Oh, Matthew, that was just so sweet. If only we deserved it. <clears throat> okay, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. Hope you made it through the story. Yeah, hope the Earth has not been hit by that asteroid just yet and you've heard it. So our cast list for today's story, let me see if I can remember that. You know, an interesting thing, maybe before we do the cast list, we need to do the saga of this story. I think it, it would be appropriate because the cast list kind of flows with with the saga so well, let's... Where, where do we begin i mean what exactly happened with the story Bill? Uh, you know it's hard to say but i think it all goes back to the day uh we accepted the story i was really excited about it i was laughing to myself when the phone rang Hello? Big, is this Bigglesby Anklevich? It is. Who's this? I'm someone from your past. That doesn't exactly narrow it down. Sorry, it's Liesl. Okay, that narrows it down some. Who exactly? It's Liesl Franklin. We went to school together. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember. College? High school? Junior high. Through high school. I sat behind you in algebra? Nope. And earth science. And world history. And English? Sorry, I don't remember. And algebra too? And homemaking? Wait, I took a homemaking class? You were the only boy. You were very popular in there. Oh, well, that I remember. And French and keyboarding. That's quite a few classes, but I don't... I sat next to you in civics and modern art and creative writing and study hall. What did you say your name was? Liesl. Liesl Franklin. I asked you to the Sadie Hawkins dance. Ma'am, everybody asked me to the Sadie Hawkins dance. Did I say yes? No, you turned me down. Both times. Wait, Liesl? Did you have a nickname? No, just Liesl. Was it Weasel? Yes, you and some of the other jocks used to call me that. Now I remember you. You sat next to that girl with the really bad skin. No, that was me. Oh, okay, but you were friends with the gangly bucktooth girl who... Nope, that was also me. Oh, maybe I'm confusing you with the girl we threw silly putty at during the talent show? No, you're not confusing me. And it was only you that threw silly putty. Wait a minute. You weren't the one everyone said was a witch, were you? Yes, now you remember me. And didn't somebody dump a bucket of yellow water on you once? That was you. And it wasn't water. Right. You were making some stupid speech, and I had rigged a bucket of warm... The speech was graduation. I was valedictorian. 
Those sure were good times. So what's up? Well, it turns out I am now a full-fledged witch. Top tier. I've spent the last 20 years perfecting the dark arts. I'm a handmaiden of Satan now. Uh, that's a sateen. <laughs> Little Wreck-It Ralph reference. That hasn't come out yet. It's 2011, remember? Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. So, how have you been? Very well. In fact, I've finally come into my own. What do you mean? Whoa. I'm projecting into your mind an image of how I look now. You like? I do. You... Wait. That's that girl from the toothpaste commercial. I just thought that up on my own. Did you, Big? Did you? So, you're actually a witch? Yes, and I finally tracked you down to get my revenge. Revenge? For what? Your life is going pretty well nowadays, huh? Pretty well. I've finally gotten into shape. Looks like I'm going to be entertainment correspondent at work. I've got a ton of friends. I've finally got out of debt. And I just read a fun story for my podcast. Big Anklevich, I... Yeah? Big Anklevich, I curse you. I curse you in the name of the forces dark that creep between the realms. That everything you treasure shall crumble. Wait a second. Don't do that. It is already done. Your manly waistline shall expand. Your job prospects will putrefy. Your friends shall scatter, save perhaps your lamest, least cool friend. Something ghastly shall arise to sap you of your energy and finances. Despair shall be your constant companion. Ha! 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 Wait, what was that last thing you mentioned? Oh, a story for my podcast. It's called The Empire State Building Strikes Back. Consider it cursed as well. Whatever a podcast is. Don't you know about podcasts? They're like radio shows, but on the internet, you can... Silence, Anklevich, for I have cursed you and must now move on. Wreak my cruel vengeance on others who have slighted me, like Lindsay Lohan and Amanda Bynes, or Mel Gibson. Oh, it'll be glorious! <laughs> huh. That was weird. But it could have been worse. It could have been Rish calling me. <sighs> <sighs> what did you mean could have been me calling you? I don't know. That was a long time ago. Wow. So that explains what happened with this story. What do you suppose she meant when she said something would sap you of energy and finances? I have no idea. Doodly doot, doodly doot, doodly doot. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess that's kind of where the saga began. So <laughs> That sketch is from like 2012, right? <laughs> probably, I think. I don't know. Uh, wait, do you, wait, just sorry to interrupt. Do you remember the toothpaste commercial girl that you thought was hot? Oh, yeah. I still think she's hot. I wish the commercial was on. But that was so I've, long ago. Sadly, I don't remember what toothpaste was. Sadly, was. it has been so long that I've moved on, and there's now a white-haired old lady on, I think it's like a Cialis commercial or something that now I think is hot. So that just shows you how long it's been. <laughs> That's fudged up. Oh, but it's oh. true. Anyways. Okay, so I've apologized to Matthew Sanborn. That's it, just those first two names. So many times about this. Okay, maybe, maybe twice I've apologized to him. Uh, probably just once, actually. But I think the can. second apology was actually an insult That's that you sent true. his way. I, someday I will apologize to him uh, about how this story has fallen through the cracks, and then those cracks fell into the earth, and then were paved over. And a, then a, one of those water park things. What do they yes. call them? Where the things spray up in the air and the right, kids... right. The splash pad. Splash pad was built over the cracks where the story fell through and then the tectonic plates shifted and an entire mountain range sprung up and covered over that 
Uh, but yeah, it was an interesting kind of a saga. Uh, we assigned this story to a particular producer, and I'm not going to name the producer uh, because I guess Scott could be listening. Yeah, he probably still listens. I think he's still alive, although I don't know to tell you the truth. I think he may have. I, what may have happened is tectonic that... Tectonic plates, anything? No, no, not tectonic. I think what may have happened is that Doomsday killed him while he was in the process of putting this together, and then he had to fight his way back to the living. But he is probably back alive again. But, you know, in, in the interim, you know, we had to pick up the, the slack or whatever you want to say. For all I know, and I mean, I, I don't know because I don't live like next door to the guy. I couldn't go over and see what he was up to. He said he worked on it, had it done. He was ready to get it to us. And then something happened. He had some serious issues that caused basically his entire life to implode on him. And this podcast episode kind of took a backseat to uh, real life. And as far as we knew, though, at the time, we thought the guy was freaking dead. We would email him. We couldn't get a hold of him. We didn't know you what happened. You talked to somebody who did know him and asked if he yeah, was Yeah, I was checking around, and we even, like, started, I, I think somebody even started, like, a Facebook campaign to try and make sure that we could know that this guy wasn't just, like, in his garage with a hose attached to his exhaust pipe or something somewhere just waiting to be discovered. We really had no idea, and that's the way it is when you don't like know the person. You know what I mean? We correspond with all our producers just via email, and so there's nothing we can do when something like this happens. We can't call them, we can't go to their house or any of that kind of stuff. We hope that somebody will see his face on the milk cart and get in contact with us. <laughs> yeah, we really had no idea. I think we did discover that he was alive and he just couldn't get on Facebook or, or whatever the deal was. But he was alive and, you know, we just kind of, okay, well, we've got other stories that we can do and we, we pushed this episode back a while and the producer eventually was able to start getting his life back together and then he said, okay, I'm ready to get this done. And I think we even tracked down a few lines for him, a couple that he was missing or something like that. Right, right. he had it all done, but one person's one. Lines. Yeah, I think he had everything done on the story except the second for... Time through. Right, the second time through, except for Lena's lines. And so we got a hold of Scribe, and we had her record those lines for us. And luckily, I saved a copy of these lines. <laughs> these are the actual lines that we heard in from the, the story. From the first take? No, well, from the second... From the second around. time through, wow. Right. Because what people heard was the third go-round. Right, right, yeah. So the second go-around, he got it all done, and then he says, okay, I'm putting it into the Dropbox for you. And what appeared in the Dropbox was a folder titled The Empire State Building Strikes Back that was empty. And I said, hey, uh, I don't know what's going on, but this is just an empty folder. And he's like, oh, I think something... Must be wrong with my internet connection speed. or so. I don't remember what the deal was, but it didn't make a lot of sense, and it never changed. The folder remained empty forever, and I, I tried to get in touch with him a few more times, and, and, and then I think he stopped responding. He's probably just like, oh, crap, if I just lay low long enough, these guys will leave me alone. I, I found it somewhat strange because... I mean, if he really did the whole thing and was just missing those one lines and, and then he finished it and all he had to do was get us the finished product, I would move heaven and earth to get the finished. I would buy a thumb drive, put it on the thumb drive and, and mail stick it, it in you. the friggin' mail if I had to. Because the poor the guy story. did all that work twice. Right, because of and all the work. And for it never to be heard, for it never to have gone anywhere, what a, a shame. Yeah, it, it seems just like an awful thing. So again, we had to go, okay, well, we've got some other stories. We can uh, just use those, and this one will have to go to the back burner again as we figure out what the heck's going on. And you know, We never heard from this producer any, any further, and so it kind of just got put to the very end of the schedule, and we didn't know what to do with it. And I think eventually you, you probably just felt so ashamed 
anytime you pulled out your Dune Steve shirt and put it on and then you realize, oh no, we we still haven't done Empire State Building Strikes Back. This is a symbol of shame, this spiraling D. It's like a Nazi symbol now. It's so no, it's, despicable. It's a scarlet A. Yes, it's like the scarlet letter putting it on your chest. And so finally you came up with a plan, which was? Uh, we would record it live at the New Media Expo. Right. And so that's what we did. So, as the saga goes, the cast list includes Rish Outfield as Dr. Oh, you know, the funny thing is I still had your lines from before when you were Dr. Nefarious. The second time too. Yeah, the second or I don't even remember what time it was from, but I actually still had those. I didn't use them because obviously you went through and did them all again. But Rich Outfield was Doctor Nefarious. I was. Did I have a name? I was Malcolm. The, Malcolm, thank you. I was the lead character, Malcolm, who was the first person narrator slash main character. We Scarf. had Tom Tancredi do one line in there, which was. What What's was it, it like, like to, to ride in the ice mercible? <laughs> he did 11 takes of that. <laughs> we had, let's see, so we had Scribe, obviously, doing uh, Scribe Harris, Lauren Scribe Harris, doing her lines. Lauren Sanborn Scribe Harris Smith. Yes, doing <laughs> the lines of Lena. We had Dave Thompson, podcast, podcast enforcer, enforcer, as... Govia, who was in the character's head, was all we ever saw of Govia. But he was actually the savior because, you know, he managed to get Torvald to uh, fly to off away. to Arcturus or wherever it was that he went off to. Um, we also had Renee Chambliss do the line of the upset receptionist. I love, what was it? There's some kind of sweetener or something. <laughs> it was Stev Stevia? What is that crap called? Splenda. Splenda, there we go. <laughs> the name thought of Splenda. And she interrupts like this life or death conversation to complain about it. And the worst part is the main character feels bad that he cut her off. He's <laughs> no, like, oh, it's that there will be hell to if pay. If we live, I'm going to hear it from her for that. Uh, so she had that line, or those. I think there was two. Um, lastly, Marshall Latham... Which was funny, I remember the day that we recorded it, <laughs> he had his own mic just for him. He had his recorder rolling the entire time so that he could say the one line at the end of the story that he wound up with. <laughs> He's just like sitting there going, do you guys really want this whole recording? I've been recording for 45 minutes, and uh, the one line I do say is, it's at 44.30. <laughs> but yes, Marshall was one of the technicians in the lab who suddenly became basically a demigod or whatever you want to call it. I think that's a whole cast list, right? Somebody did monkey sounds. <laughs> we got up to some monkey shines. Yeah, that was an interesting thing. You know, I, I really wanted this story, A, to have the production that it deserved. Because after three, four, five, however many years we've made Matthew wait, I didn't want to put out some shitty half-assed version of this thing. I wanted it to be good. Unfortunately, yeah, this, this shitty half-assed version is what you guys got. But, no, I'm just kidding. I thought this was still good. You I don't know if everybody agrees at least two-thirds of your ass in <laughs> it. I wanted there to be a lot of cool sound effects, and I wanted it to be interesting. But monkey sounds are hard. They're not easy to come by. I looked in a lot of places for monkey sounds, you know, uh, gorilla sounds, and either it was just some dude recording himself going, hur, 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 or it was like at a zoo, and you can hear a million animals in the background, along with a couple spider monkeys or something, which sound just like birds whistling. They barely sound like monkeys anyway, and they don't sound anything like a gorilla. I did find one, I want to say it was a baboon, that like screamed really crazily. And I had that at the start when the gorilla first attacks. But it was way too much and I finally had to 
get rid of that too, I think. Did I get rid of that or was it I still there? I don't remember hearing that. Okay, noise. so I did get rid of it. Because, yeah, I had it there for a while and I'm finally like, you know, this is awful. And I just had to get rid of it. And so all the monkey sounds are me, which I guess I'm, that's the one part where I feel like I didn't get it as awesome as I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be much cooler and the monkey to be more interesting but it was the best that I could do I, I just had to do my best and that's my best so I can't do any better that's just the nature of a superlative so that I just had to leave it at that and pray that Matthew would forgive me again <laughs> but yeah so that that was that I, I put in like the little sound effects for every time somebody mentally telepathized a a line to somebody else which at points it was confusing where I wasn't sure was this telepathy do I need to put in the sound effect or was this actual spoken line especially at the end and I think I got them all right <laughs> but I don't even know Matthew probably is like every time he hears that throwing his hand up no it's nothing like that that sucks <laughs> it's just like a guy talking in your head why would you put the dumb beep in I don't know I, I wanted some kooky sound effects too, because this is. Well, what about the slurpy sound for the uh, two dimensional being? <laughs> oh, what did you think of that sound? Well, I thought it was disturbing, but I mean, it was supposed to be. It, it was some kind of protoplasm type being, right? <laughs> yeah, it. That sound was actually all it was was water splashing into water. There's like basically like a, a I don't know a bathtub full of water, and then somebody took a cup and poured it into it. And I took those sounds and reversed them so that they sounded weird <laughs> and off. And then, yeah, I just kept using them on every time it would hit and do stuff. And then I had a couple where it was like more of a kind of a sound. And so that would be more when he pops out of it or whatever. I, I enjoyed making that stuff. I thought that was fun, actually. And I'm glad that you liked the sound because I guess that must mean it was worth it. That stuff goes back to the old days when we did everything on the Dune Steve. Like, the, there were two or three episodes we've done this year where all I did was go through and do, like, a sound effects pass. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh, somebody else actually put somebody the Somebody else had edited it. And then and you I just like, I want and more. Went, <laughs> and then played with that, and that was the sound of the ship. That stuff is so satisfying where that's all you focus on, you know what I uh -huh. mean? Where it's just like, I want to find sounds. I want to do this. I want to change this or whatever. But it, that's just the thing I can do. I'm not responsible for everything. It's making sure that Scribe gets her lines back to us and what kind of music can we do? And, oh, you know, there's a little bit of background sound here, but there's no way to edit it out. And you know, all the stuff that gets piled on your back when you're the producer of the story. Yeah, it makes me think of like movie directors. You know, people who start out as, like, for example, George Lucas or something. You know, he starts out, he goes and he directs a couple of movies and he makes Star Wars. And then, you know, once he's he's successfully made this blockbuster, now he can step back and he can just be the executive producer or whatever. Now he can just kind of, like, worry about the crap he cares about and leave all the minutia to this other poor sap who has to... Uh, not n not to say that the people who are volunteering their time for us <laughs> are saps. <laughs> We're actually really appreciative of all of you. Uh, oh, shoot. Where's 080T? Can you edit that out somehow? He's dead and in oh, robot crap. hell. crap. But, you know, Okay, they, I'll just go on. <laughs> they are poor saps in a way. In a way, because yes. Because they've volunteered to do this. And a lot of times they don't know how much work it's going to be. Right. And yeah, the poor guy who took his life twice doing this project or whatever, <laughs> I feel bad for him because, I mean, A, his life went through upheaval and all that. But two, at any point, somebody could say to us, hey, I just, you know, I can't do it. I'm too busy or whatever right now. And we would totally understand. We would understand more than anybody because we've done this ourselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're a producer for us. And you're in over your head and you're like, you know, I can't do the music and the, you know, all I can do is just the voices and then give it back to you. That's good because that's one less step we have to do. You ended up producing this, but it was from a recording where we were all in the same room together, except for Scribe. And still it had to be an unbelievable amount of work. Right? Yeah, it, it was still a lot of work. It's interesting, though. I was starting to talk about that whole thing is... 
you and I are kind of like George Lucas was. You know, we started out this podcast and we were on our own. We were doing everything ourselves. We had to do each all the minutia. We had to focus on all of that as well as everything else. We had to be the director and the producer and the executive producer all in one. And it was really hard. And then we started getting some help and we got people that basically volunteered to be our directors. And now all we have all we have to do is deal with the the, the more higher decisions you know that okay we want to pick this story to do or hey here's a a voice actor that can do this voice for you kind of a thing and it has made our life worth living again and every now and then we step in and we actually do direct uh episode ourselves like this one and i still love it I still really enjoy it. And like, you know, we were talking about all, you know, making up the sound effects, taking the water splashes, running them backwards so that I've got something that sounds alien and slurpy and interesting and fun. That kind of stuff is cool. And it's fun to be able to do that every once in a while. And I'm glad that we still have that opportunity to be able to step in and do something ourselves, even if it's a lot more minutia and a lot more difficult than we wanted you know to deal with anymore it's still usually worth it it's funny because i know that it's going to be a lot of effort and i kind of cringe and and try and avoid it but once i actually get down into it get my nose in there and then i'm actually doing the work you know, it's fun i you know there's a reason why i started the show in the first place i guess because i love this kind of stuff i enjoy it that's why our you know our, our first podcasts were relatively low on sound effects i think our first show had like two sound effects there was like a revving car engine once and a gunshot (laughs) and that was it but it didn't take long before the sound effects were freaking over the top and i had a great time when i got to the part where the uh empire state building implodes itself or i don't know what the correct term would be for what it did uncollapses mm-hmm. back into the world and just i was laying explosion over explosion over explosion and it was so much fun just to play that and my kids were in the other room going what the heck is going on because i just kept you know having to play this sound effect again oh okay i'm gonna put this here play it again oh yeah no i'll put this here mm-hmm. And, you know, I just kept adding to it. I don't know how many channels of audio I had by the time I was done there, but I I was above 10. I know that much. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed doing that. And then taking a sound like that and running it in reverse for it to getting (laughs) re-collapsed back down. Is that how you did it? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I'll have to listen to that part again. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed putting this story together. I hope Matthew enjoyed listening to it and he, and he feels like he got his his money's worth or his time's worth or whatever you want to say i feel like we ought to send him a check for like a couple hundred bucks just to say thanks for not i don't know taking us to court <laughs> <laughs> well recently we had a guy withdraw his story from us and that hurt my feelings but matthew certainly could have done this long long ago and you know i hope that this story saw publishment, <laughs> saw print elsewhere or was podcast elsewhere or whatever in the meantime, that it just didn't sit in limbo tied to us because we had said we'd take it. But if he did that, you know, that's really kind of him. I just, uh, you know, there are things that you can't anticipate and there was nothing against this story except for that once, you know, it fell apart with the other producer. It was a sound effects heavy story. So our new producers that volunteered probably weren't leaping on the chance to do this one. You know what I mean? It's not just two people in a room. And so it just kept getting put back in, but now it's out and hopefully everybody enjoyed it. And uh, you know, I really enjoy the, you know what? Actually the meteor just hit the earth. Oh, it's not out. Actually. It's been, it's been prevented again. (laughs) That's a shame. (laughs) Shame about the human race too, but more importantly, the shame about the podcast. (laughs) I feel bad that uh, Jennifer Lawrence is dead, but I feel more bad that you, no one gets to hear your reverse implosion, explosion, <laughs> monkey sounds. 
the more it's funny how the, this happens and uh, I'm, we've talked about it several times but when you work on a story doing a, a producing a story like this you come to know the story better than anyone save its author and sometimes maybe even more so than the author because you go over and over and over and over this story again and again until you've got it you know exactly how it's supposed to be and there's been several times where a story gets submitted to the dune steve and i read it over and i think mm, nah, that story's pretty good all right we could do that one i guess i mean i could go either way but you know that's fine and then later i work on it and i hear the story again and again and i the more i hear it i'm just like oh my gosh this story is this story is good and then after a while, this story is great. Oh, and this part is in here and this and how we wove it through together. And oh, and this story is one of those stories. I think it, it didn't jump out and like grab me by the throat or whatever when I first read it. But as I've worked on it, the more and more I listen to it, the more I love the story. I really love everything about it and how all the things that are worked through and the, you know, the, the thing that. There's a train going by. Yeah, it's, it goes by like every two hours whenever yeah. I'm trying to record. <laughs> I wonder if it's loud enough that people can hear it or oh, not. Oh, definitely is. Yeah? Because I, I live miles down, down from, from the down train, the road, and, and you can hear, hear it. it. And I don't record outside. I record in the right, With the windows shut and everything. So, yeah, I, I just love... <laughs> I love that we have this multi-gorilla that appears what's the gorilla's name anybody <laughs> i'm not going to tell you if you don't remember you'll have to listen to the story again and by the way that's one thing that's funny scribe could not get the gorilla's name quite right i don't know if you notice but basically what matthew did with the gorilla's name is he took eight gorilla's names combined them together the gorillas were like coco and bobo and momo and fofo etc and he just put them all into one gigantic name and scribe could never get all of them she always says photo at the end i don't know if you noticed that it should be fofo but it comes out as photo and i just had to go with it because again if i had to go back and make this perfect it was never ever ever going to make the the meteor will have come and gone earth will be completely desolate and we'd still be like, oh, wait, we, we need this one other thing. So I, I let it slide. I hope Matthew didn't mind that either. The, ba the, the gorilla's name should end in Fofo. <laughs> just, uh, just to let you know. But yeah, he, he put all those names together. And yeah, he has this multi-gorilla that just appears at the beginning. It's sort of just a little thing. Not a big deal. They collapse it down onto the little tag. But at the end, of course... The gorilla is up at the top of the Empire State Building. We've got King Kong on the Empire State Building, as well as the Empire State Building striking back. It's, uh, you know, I don't know. It just, I, I just really loved how it all came together. It's really well done. It's a great story, and I really enjoyed it. And I hope people appreciated it. I don't know that they can possibly appreciate it as much as me, because they haven't heard it two dozen times like I have <laughs> but they can if you really want to you can go back and listen to it 23 more times <laughs> there's nothing to stop you maybe by then you'll appreciate it as much as I or maybe by then you'll want to come and find where I live and kill me for saying that you should do that I don't know I don't really care because there's a meteor on the way and you know you just got to live life while you got it your mountain is waiting you know Get on your way. The meteor is waiting as well. That kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I like the tone of the story a lot. It's really funny and it's light and it's it's like kind of throwback adventure, you know? Yeah, but, it's very it's golden also... age of comics kind of tone. Maybe Silver Age or what do we think? Golden, Silver? Probably Silver Age. It's silver? A, I mean, Golden Age is 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 very square jawed and World War Two centric okay. and all that stuff. More fighting gangsters and Nazis than fighting crazy mad scientists. Yeah, it's the the Silver Age is like you know what the space race was on. And it's like okay. ooh, everything is possibilities are endless and all that. And that, that's what I felt like was going on here. But I just I can't get over 
the call about the Splenda in the middle of this <laughs> life or death situation. Yeah, that is a very good bit. And yeah, the fact, why would she even be on the mental telepathy wavelength thing? What what would be the purpose of having your sex? Like, maybe that would be useful in the well, office? He'd forgotten that he left that line <laughs> open. But, um, we, we got Renee and Scribe on a episode, but they were years apart, right? Yeah. It's almost like Being it really was. In love. Oh, okay. Sorry, what? Go on. No? Okay. It's almost like uh, it really was recorded at New Media Expo, but at both New Media Expos, because there were people that were in it that were only at one, and other people that were only at the other. We went two times. Scribe only made it to the first one. Dave Thompson was only at the second one. But yeah, we were on some kind of telepathy wavelength or something, and we were able to combine it all. So it's kind of fun that way. But yeah, years apart, and yet intertwined something. I don't know. You talk. What? <laughs> I don't know what to say. This is the first episode we've recorded in months. And that sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not. It's yeah, we've had episodes that came out, but it's been a while since we've actually needed to record one because we had a bunch of like triple word score stories that are done, and we could just bang out like the episodes for them the last episode that came out was switching and i heard myself saying crap and we were talking about stuff that seems so old and outdated and i was like oh my gosh whoa, whoa, whoa. but didn't she say her story in january yes would yes forthcoming i mean that just shows how, how behind we are on these dang things and i feel bad again you know it's like that we don't get to them immediately and that things aren't timely anymore and and you know i mean not in the case of matthew sanborn smith i mean that that we took it to the whatever's past the nth degree <laughs> in his case but we talk about how nice it would be to do this as a job for a living and where you know we have to get together every monday or whatever day of the week it's going to be so that we can get this out because you know we don't get paid otherwise and in which case you wouldn't have these super dated references right. but but yeah life I, kicks in the door and has its way with us yeah instead yeah we've got we've both got real jobs that demand that we show up when we're scheduled to show up well my job will let you not show up <laughs> once and, then, uh, and not even bother to call and say right, anything. you know <laughs> you can probably not show up three or four times if you have an excuse <laughs> but yeah, one time just is not called because you don't want to come in is okay. Yeah, you know, we've got jobs that get in the way. We've got families that get in the way. We've all got something ghastly that will arise to sap us of our energy and finances. You know, I mean, that's just kind of the way it is in life. And we all just have to do our best. And maybe there will come a day when, you know, writing and podcasting is our job. I think both of us would love that maybe we can even work toward that being a reality but it's not likely maybe it could supplement a regular job who knows until then we're going to do our best and uh as is the nature of superlatives that's the best that we can do Ooh, that was a callback too <laughs> i'm just got, i've got a my phone just keeps calling back i can't <laughs> <laughs> And now it's time for a special new segment of our show. It's called Go Plug Yourself. Really? That's what we're calling it? Yeah, we're going to call it that announcer, man. What is that? Is there some kind of other way that that could be interpreted? I don't get it. That is really crappy. I mean, wow, craptacular. It's nice that announcer man would walk by at that moment. <laughs> yes, this is something, a New Year's resolution for the future, for the year 2013 next year. <laughs> when we were talking about things that we should change on the show, we thought we needed to do something where we talk about other projects that we've got going on so people can give us money. Because we need money to eat. Yeah, that's kind of a callback to talking about doing this for a living. Ah, okay, um, an, an inadvertent callback. Yes, we, we thought that folks who listen to the show might be interested in knowing if we had something that was available out there. Um, both of us are writers, 
uh, let me do the air quotes. And, uh, you know, we write on occasion. And one of the, the things that, especially you, Rish, have been trying to do, because it's one of the things that you're most afraid of doing, is sharing your stuff, putting it out there, making it available for someone to read and brutally destroy in a in a one star review if they want to wait wait what <laughs> that people could do that <laughs> oh crap i need to get over and delete it off of amazon now uh so you've done that and you've been doing it really well for the past probably a year almost or more how long have you been at it are we talking about self-publishing? Yeah, Amazon? self-publishing stuff on Amazon and Smashwords. Smash uh, yeah, it's going on a year. By the time this comes out, it's probably been a year. And By there the were time times. This comes out three or four years. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> Do you remember when Amazon.com was this thing? <laughs> at, at first, I thought I would publish something every single week, and that never. That was a foolish expectation. A little of lofty. But once again, life got in the way, and I wasn't able to do that. But the most recent thing that I published was a Western story that I wrote called Birth of a Sidekick. And you had already read it, and, you know, you have already read a lot of things that no one else will ever read. But this one, I thought it would be fun to do as a uh, an audiobook as well. And it was the first time that I'd ever sat down with my own work and recorded it for sale for audible.com and so the story is out there if somebody would like to purchase it uh, it's called birth of a sidekick and it's sort of about a gunsling or a famous uh what basically was, a lone ranger kind of a guy yeah like a, that kind of guy comes to this orphanage to pick his new sidekick who's going to you know accompany him on these exciting adventures in the old west you know and catching bad guys and stopping crimes and 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 uh, lone ranger is coming to find robin that's very <laughs> that's a mixed metaphor but that's exactly what it is and 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 this little boy ben parks is selected and you know he has this expectation of what his life is going to be how his life is going to be changed and the future that lies ahead of him because so many other boys have been picked to be sidekicks for this man uh, but it doesn't go according to plan Anyway, for some reason, you liked the story. I did. I read this. God, it's been years since I read this. I don't know how I wound up with it and why you decided to share it with me. Because I don't think it was something that you had just barely written when you shared it with me. It was something that had been in your trunk for two years or more, probably. I don't know. But yeah, you shared it with me and I read it. And the, a good thing about this, this is a, a fairly long story. I would say it's novella or at least novelette length. It's yeah, see, I, I never 10 know the to difference. 15,000 words long or so, right? So you'll get your money's worth if you do go and, and grab this story. It's it's a good, a, a fair-sized read. You'll get some enjoyment time out of it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it was really interesting. The way things went uh, in this story, I wasn't expecting it, which is always good when you're reading a story, especially something that's a Western, where, you know, there are... You know, that that seems like one of those kind of genres where it's pretty well set in stone how stories go. You know, there's a pretty well-known way that things are going to progress. Um, and when you get something that doesn't do that, that's always good. So I, I really enjoyed it. And you had Dave Krummenacher make you some, some awesome <laughs> art for this, this book, right? I did. We don't talk about our cover art very often because it's usually except the for, last thing <laughs> except for to be, to be moan how awful it is to try and put something together because of your lack of experience okay, yes, and that, expertise that we do talk about <laughs> but we don't usually say hey cover art this week was done by because it's the last piece of the puzzle right before we publish usually and it's after we've already recorded but he did this art for in the gloaming which was just friggin' great. It was almost as good as the guy who did the art for Time Pressure. I just, I, I knew what I wanted for the cover art, but I couldn't do it myself. And I asked him if he would do it, and he said yes, and uh, and now I want to use him for everything. Yeah, he does really, really beautiful stuff. I really enjoy his, his artwork, and, and you got him to put that together for you, so you could actually, that's the one thing that always holds you back, you know, you, you made the goal to publish something every week. 
you might actually achieve that goal <laughs> if you were experienced and had expertise at making cover art. Or if I just made you do it. <laughs> I, I mean, I've tried to say that I'm willing, but I know you don't want to rely on me to do that. So I haven't pushed. No, because but... then I'll start to despise you. Because I'll be like, you know, uh, you said you'd have that for me on Saturday. And <laughs> I guess there is it. that. And so now it's your fault that I haven't published it <laughs> instead of it actually being my fault. But yeah, this this stuff is really pretty. So there's that. I mean, that's another thing that you get to check out is this really cool art that goes along with the uh, with the story. So I, and I'm not the author of this story, so I'm really not invested in it in any way. I think you should do it. I give it thumbs up. <laughs> well, thank you, man. And the the thing with Amazon is you are allowed to choose how much something costs. Uh huh. And our buddy, oh, I'm sorry, your buddy, Dean Wesley Smith, Sanborn, said <laughs> that, you know, you should never give it away for free. You should always charge at least two ninety nine for everything that's out there. But the thing with Audible, with the, uh, the audio version of it, is they decide how much to charge. Uh -huh. And I think it's depending on how long the piece is. But that's really frustrating to me, and, and, and I'm always trying to figure out a way around that. You know, I want to give people more for their money, and so maybe one day I'll do like a, a collection that has this and several other stories in it so that, you know, people feel okay using their Audible credit, uh -huh. you know, wasting it on that. So by the time people hear this episode, the Audible version and the ebook version will be available. Yeah, I think so. I, the Audible version is already out there and submitted and just waiting for them to send me a message back saying, yeah, yeah, it's good. Go on ahead. It's, we'll publish it next week or whatever the deal is. But uh, we'll put a link in the show notes if you'd like. This is going to be, we're going to try and do this every new episode where we talk about something that we've done that people can go out and buy. And I, yeah, I'm sorry that if it feels like we're selling something, but... I guess that's what we're doing, so deal with it. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, well, because if people buy it and people said, oh, hey, that was really good. And, oh, and I got to hear Rich speak Spanish and it was terrible. Then it will encourage me to put more stuff out. Just push aside a tiny bit of time and say, okay, I'm going to do that again because somebody said, when's the next thing coming out? True. And if we're doing this in every episode, that means I'm going to have to get off my keister and actually publish some stuff myself. Yeah, that's the end. so that's even more helpful for you. All right, so that's Go Plug Yourself. What the crap? Yeah, that's what we're going to call it, okay? I'm sorry. You'll have to get over it. <laughs> Do we have anything else to discuss before we go any further? No, no, it's, uh, this feels like an end. All right, it is an end, but it is also a beginning. What? Are you talking about the meteor shower again? <laughs> a beginning for the cockroaches, which will rise up and be the dominant species on this planet. Thank you to everyone who participated in the voices on this thing. Thank you to Julie Hoverson for showing up. And uh, thank you to Matthew Sanborn Smith for the incredible long suffering that you showed. We, again, we really hope we did it well enough that, that you felt it was worth it. I love the story. Thanks a lot for, for sending it our way. Sorry that it became such... It was a cold case. It was one <laughs> of those that the, that the policeman solved years later. <laughs> and thanks to Sunny C for the, the, the totally cool art that came with this story. I just love the half King Kong, half Star Wars thing that we had going on. Oh, it's so rad. And... Uh, I'd like to thank my mommy for sticking it through all nine months and giving birth to me. And Okay, I'm done. All right. <laughs> Thanks to the Academy <laughs> for this well-deserved award. <laughs> I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And this has been Coco Momo Fofo Toto Ho Ho Jojo Bobo. Bobo. Photo. Photo, yes. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, everybody. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. 
This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Oh, it wasn't recording. Mother... The Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine does not cause hearing loss, but sometimes it does make it seem like an option worth considering. Take two. The Empire State Building Strikes Back. I hope you enjoy it. Bump ba da dum bump 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 ba da dum. That's not a good fanfare. That's that's a owned fanfare. Is there a fanfare I can do that won't be Fox fanfare? <laughs> like a tada, a circus kind of a fanfare. Or should I just cut the fanfare altogether? Yeah, I think we're all right without the fanfare. It, okay. it sounded like you put like an extra six minutes of music down at the end of the episode so that we could do our author's note and stuff over them. Is that right? I may have. I wonder if we have an author's note. <laughs> and if we could even oh, find it shoot. if we did. Yeah, I'm sure we could find it. We put Although it on. It'd be so outdated. We put it on and Matthew Sanborn Smith sounds like a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> His voice is so high-pitched because it was so long ago. It might be funny, just to, if, even if it wasn't, to take it and speed it up. <laughs> like, that's Matthew Sanborn Smith when he was still 12 years old, back when he wrote this story. <laughs> He's like, thank you for being my very first sale of a story. And it's like, multiple award winning Matthew Sanborn Smith said in his author's note. When I grow up, I'm going to be a writer. And I can't wait to see how the Star Wars prequels end. This is Lauren Scribe Harris reading the lines of Lena from The Empire State Building Strikes Back. Best title except for Asshat Magic Spider, which is still a better title than anything ever. Because Scott Westerfeld. <laughs> yep, this is gonna be great. Coco Bobo to Oh, fuck. Okay. Yeah, there's gonna be cursing. There's gonna be lots of cursing. To join the thousands of job applicants who would squirt. <laughs> Squirt for the chance. <laughs> <laughs> to join the thousands of job applicants who would squirt for the chance to join the big man. <laughs> Work for the big. Oh. <clears throat> you just want to say squirt again? Oh, join was up there. Yeah, I just wanted to say that because I didn't think I made it offensive enough. Are you in this, Marshall? I don't know. We don't know. Yeah, I. I Do you want to be lean? <laughs> I had another script just in case. Uh, I don't know how many. I think there's a few characters later on that yeah. don't have. Yeah, that's cool. But I don't. I haven't looked but at this in, since two years ago when we recorded the day <laughs> thing the first time. So I don't know what it's got. No, I just I'm recording just in case. So. Okay. Don't go there. You think they're angry now? Oh, my cats are angry now. Hey guys, stop! No. Nope. Nope. Guys, jeez. Okay. Nope. Out. Go. <sighs> I'm gonna rename my cat. One of them is gonna be Coco Bobo Totohoho. The other one is gonna be Soso Momofoto. I don't like the cat one. The cat one? The fat one. Wow. Well, they're both cat ones. Anyway, I'm moving on. I took the gun from her hand. I can put a stop. To all of them in one go. Please don't get killed, Malcolm. He's 20 moves ahead of everyone. Nine moves in front of Brian Lincoln. Ah, suit yourself. That was a weird little sound I put in front of that. Whatever. Gynecological exams. There's lots of weird sounds. That was maybe overboard. Okay, shut up, Lauren. He stepped over to the part of the massive computer terminal which took up the north wall. I only knew that because they were all North Walls here. And he spoke to Torvald in a language that I'd never heard before. <clears throat> okay, so how do I do a conversation in a language you've never heard before? You say, Kothatholotu, Zibas. I did bring that upon myself, didn't I? Torvald, Lopik and Thropla, put it together, up there, put it Bah. <laughs> Sounded like Klingon, didn't it? Sorry. I was thinking Star Wars somehow. <laughs> Uta Puta Solo? <laughs> <laughs>
something yanked it from my hand, and then I was inside the purple thing again. I felt it inside of me as I hit the floor. It dragged me hard. I couldn't pull against it enough to even get to my feet. Okay, let's struggle with the purple thing for a minute. I want to hear you. You want to hear me struggle? Yep. Uh, uh. Ew. <laughs> the purple, not the brown. <laughs> How do you know you won't like a singularity if you've never even tried one? He asked. Then he made a warbling sound in a third language. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to my left, one of Lena's fellow technicians flared out of existence. As in, disappeared. What the hell? Marshall, your time has finally come. Okay. I heard that. No. I heard that. It is already done. Your manly waistline shall expand. Your job prospects will putrefy. Can you imagine how she'll do this? Your <laughs> friends shall scatter, save perhaps your lamest, least cool friend. Something ghastly shall arise to sap you of your energy and finances. Despair shall be your constant companion. <laughs> Our cast list for today goes as follows. Did you fart? I farted so bad it hurt. <laughs> Oh, yikes. <laughs> it burns. Oh, man.